Thank you, Paul, and thanks in this organization for the invitation to be here with you. It's always nice to be able to share. And actually, I hope that today we can share. I look forward to hearing from you what you've been doing here in South Africa in terms of open educational resources. And I'll try and bring in some of, of a Latin American perspective, you know, being the, the develop, from the developing world, working with the developing countries. I think we have an awful lot to share. Uh, but I also try and bring in some of my experience acquired whilst at the Open University UK, uh, working for a couple of projects there in open educational resources, Open Learn and OWNET. So I've been working in the field of OER since 2006 as a researcher. Um, and, you know, I've, I'm very happy to say that I've had the chance to come across a number of different initiatives and today I just want to share with you a little bit of what I, I've learned over the years and hear from you, your views. So I would really like it to be a, a participative workshop, you know, let's try and, and, and interact uh, in pairs or in small groups if we can, move about, talk to other people. I would um, encourage you to try and meet people that you haven't met before. I think it's very important to try and make connections when you are at conferences and try and share experiences. So uh, by the end of the workshop today, I really hope that you've managed to speak to at least one or two people that you haven't met before um, yet. Okay, so let's go, let's talk a little bit about the back channels <coughs> for this. Uh, so hashtag again, uh, ODL12, and um, I'm hoping that we can use a couple of different back channels actually. Uh, and also because I was expecting a room with 250 people and I was thinking it would be very difficult for us to, to be chatting and interacting. So I've decided to use my blog as well as a way of sharing content with you and there's another back channel. So I would suggest to use Twitter more for comments because we have a limited number of characters that we can write on Twitter. But also if you have connection, internet connection, Try and access the, the, uh, the blog, I'm going to show you the blog in a minute, for longer comments, because I think this, this is something that can be ongoing, you know, it doesn't need to finish today when we finish the workshop. It may be the case that afterwards you think of something else, you want to post a comment, you'd hope someone would look at it and would give you an answer, or would like to engage in some sort of conversation afterwards, so you could, we could have an ongoing channel if you want to. And for longer comments, I think the blog uh, can be an option. And also, please let me know if the comments mechanism is working there, because I tried to make everything open yesterday to make sure I wouldn't need to approve every comment, but please do get back to me in case you cannot. So I have to go back to the settings, okay? Okay, so this is the blog. I want to show you what I've done here. I, I have to say, in terms of academic practice, Laura, I don't know what comments you can make in terms of my academic practice, but I tend to use my blog in a very different way. I do not... Uh, often find the time to write. I'd like to, I'd love to be able to do what Paul Pringle does. <laughs> but I tend to use it sometimes for loading up uh, PowerPoint presentations and extra resources when I give talks and workshops, and that's what I have done for today. So just to let you know, um, all the websites that I'm citing today, because I, I intend to, to talk through and talk to you about some OER initiatives, they are here. As you can see, you have uh, their website addresses. Uh, I've also uploaded my PowerPoint slides here for this talk. Um, I did it on SlideShare, but then I couldn't, for some reason, I couldn't uh, put the SlideShare link over here. So there, it's nice and easy. You just download the files and you can remix it as you wish. Just trying to put things into practice, right? This openness, way of thinking. Uh, I have also put a link for the Open Learn Research Report which is 2008-2009, and although you might think, oh, come on, Andrea, but it's 2009, it's still so up-to-date. It's incredibly up-to-date in terms of the sorts of discussions it brings. So it may be interesting for any one of you who is uh, considering implementing any sort of um, open educational resource initiative to have a look at there, because in this, result, in this report, we explain in detail all the process of implementation of, uh, uh, of open educational resources at the Open University UK. 
in terms of technology, in terms of user engagement, who the user is, in terms of analytics, pedagogy, all sorts of things. Okay, so it may be a useful resource. What else? Um, okay, so the report here. Oh, and something else we're going to use later on today, which is a sort of a template, something I was trying to put together, but it's really a draft. And this is the aim. This is something for us to remix. The purpose today is can we get something better than that? And if you do, please share it back with me. Put it back online, use the same license, redistribute it. I think this is the idea. Yeah? So this is something else we're going to use later on. And for anyone wanting to leave a comment, you just come here, leave a comment, okay? And that's it, right. Before we start, I just would like to see some show of hands here. So how many of you um, have actually been doing OER, producing open educational resources? Can you please raise your hands? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so how many of you actually know what open educational resources are with confidence? Please, show your hands. Okay, most of you. Ex okay, excellent. So, um, so how many of you have actually used an open resource? Please. Okay, okay, I think this is interesting information for me. So there are more people here that, that, that use resources than actually produce resources. So this is interesting for us to know. Okay, how many of you are actually considering implementing some sort of OER initiative, either by yourself, on your own practice, or in your institution? Please, show of hand. Okay, most of you, thank you very much. Okay, this gives me an idea of, on how to direct this. So, as I said, this is the report I, w I was telling you about, the Open Learning Research Report, to which I've put the link in there. Some of the information I'm going to give you here comes from this report in terms of user engagement, I'll tell you in a minute. But I also would like to point you to a couple of other publications that you may know already, but that are very, very interesting, which is the Guidelines for Open Educational Resources in Higher Education by UNESCO and the Commonwealth of Learning, and the Basic Guide to Open Educational Resources OER, they are all under Creative Commons, you can download, you can find them over the internet. They're very useful resources if you want to go further to what we discussed today. And there's this one uh, made by our Dutch colleagues, the OER Trend Report, which is very interesting as well. I don't know how many of you have had the chance to look at it, but it's a fantastic um, um, report talking about the Dutch experiences in OER. Okay, so you are all very familiar with OER. So we all know that open education resources are open digital content, content of any format, audio, drawings, text, books, research, any sort of content made available, freely available. But the difference between any content on the internet to open educational resource, to an open educational resource, is that it has a license, an open license. That's the main difference. If it doesn't have a license, we don't consider it to be an open educational resource. Yeah? And something we were talking about yesterday, an open educational resource can also be uh, some sort of educational material that is under public domain. And public domain is different from being publicly available. So this is something we have to remember. Um, as I was saying yesterday to some colleagues here at UNISA, uh, in Brazil, what do we consider public domain? When an author, after 70 years of the death of an author, uh, their, their intellectual production is considered to be in the public domain. Okay, after 70 years. But it varies from country to country. I know that in some countries, you can actually say, I want my work to be under public domain, and you can assign it. So if you actually go, I think in the US it's like that. So if you actually go to the Creative Commons uh, website, when, you're, when you go to choose a license, you see that you can choose to put your, um, your content under public domain, but you have to make sure that that actually applies for your country or for your jurisdiction, okay? So please do double check. I'm not sure how it works here in South Africa. Perhaps you need just to do a Google search or have some legal advice. But it's always very important to understand the difference between open licensed material, publicly available material, and public domain uh, content. Okay? 
Right, so now something else that is very interesting, it's not only about licensing and making content available, but also use and adaptation. And this is something we tend to forget. We keep talking about making, of, making resources available, choosing the right license, what can we do to open up access to education, but I don't hear as much talk about how have we been using resources? Have we been reusing resources, which is a step further, embedded in the concept of open educational resources? What about adaptation and redistribution? This is why I said to you, take out that template, remix it and put it back online. I think this is the idea, yeah? The sharing, sharing of content. So, as I said, I was going to cite some, some data back from 2009 and I look forward to, to do this, a new uh, research on this type of data. This is UK-based data from OpenLearn and we're going to run similar research in Brazil next year to find out who uses OER. So that's data from OpenLearn. We found out that besides um, previous students from the university and current students from the university, the audience was much broader. So we had, obviously, uh, schools, kids that would access the website because it was interesting. Teachers of all sorts of levels and background. Uh, we had retired people who wanted to keep their minds active. That's exactly what they said. We want to keep our minds active and engaged with current issues. So we want to, we like the idea to be able to engage with current courses from universities that we consider up to date and interesting. We have um, young learners who were about to start the university. They were not sure what sort of courses they want to attend, so they would take the courses at OpenLearn as a taster in order to choose their career and also in order to understand whether they would like to study online and at a distance because it's a different mode of study. So you're not only showing to the world the content you're producing, but you're always sharing a way of learning and a way of studying, a way of teaching, a way of learning, a way of studying. So it gave these students the chance to practice, you know, by doing some bits and pieces of activities, looking at how the content is presented, whether they would actually like to be an open university student. And we've seen that a lot of, a lot of them have actually turned into registered students. So for the ones who are interested in business models, yeah, this is something to bear in mind. Uh, uh, that OER can actually turn into students' registrations. Okay, then we actually had people that are professionals, uh, still working, uh, but who wanted to know what's new in their field. Engineers, people in business, professionals, okay, I don't have the time to take up formal learning. I'm a very busy person, I'm always traveling, doing things, I've got a family, but I, I want to know what's going on. I don't care for certification, for accreditation of learning. I just want to know what's going on, what universities have been teaching nowadays, because my degree dates 10 years back, five years back, and I want to know what's going on now. So this is another profile. Women, very interesting. Women who had to leave work because they, they were pregnant, had the babies and couldn't go back to work. They had to stay at home for a few years until the child grows up. Uh, so they wanted to keep again up to date and their minds active. So they said, oh, this is fantastic for me because I can fit in studying with um, other commitments, family commitments. Uh, and this actually helped them. Some of them said to us uh, in our service that it actually has helped them to go back to back to work afterwards because they said, oh, we've been studying, we've been learning, this is what we've been doing. Okay, people with some sort of disabilities, lack of mobility of some sort, who cannot be physically in a university or who cannot enroll to a formal course. And interestingly enough, people in prisons, they were another audience for us. I don't know if it can apply for any country because I don't know if in all country prisoners can have access to the internet, but in the UK we have specific programs for that. And that was a very, very interesting type of, of user. Okay, so I think this is interesting. Why am I saying that? Because if, you're, if we're thinking of offering OER, we have to think of our audience, don't we? 
who can be my audience? Who am I producing OER for? Who do I want to share my content with? Because this is going to help you decide where to publish, how to publish, and how to design for open educational resources, how to design for open content. Do you need any specific type of design? Who is your audience? How are you going to embed your pedagogy into your material? So it's very important to think of that, to think beyond the university walls, beyond your students. Yeah? Who else can benefit from it? Okay, now, something else that is very interesting. The concept of OER. Within the concept of OER, we have four, we say, we have the four R's embedded in it, yes? Reuse, revise, remix, and redistribution. So, I always advise people, bear that in mind, how do you know you're doing OER? Beyond the licensing, let's think beyond the licensing. I know I'm actually coming from an open educational practice perspective when I'm reusing content, respecting the license, of course, but reusing content, revising, looking at, okay, let's give example, reusing. You don't need to change anything to use. I like something someone else did, I'm just going to use it as it is. Perfect. Revise, okay, I think I can make a couple of changes just to fit it into my context. Fine. Remix, so I actually have an awful lot to contribute to this. I want to add photographs, I want to recontextualize it completely, I want to make major changes to this, or I want to change the media, it's a PDF file, uh, and I want to transform it into um, a PowerPoint file or into an audio file, I'm remixing. Media, remixing content. That's another way of thinking. And redistribution, because very often we forget to put it back, give it back to the community, and that's the essence of open educational resources, right? It's the sharing, it's giving back, whatever you do. And I, I love when I see someone has remixed someone I did, and then they send me an email or something, oh, hey, have a look at this, I've put your PowerPoint slides with a voiceover in this website. And then they say, originally, um, PowerPoint originally created by Andrea, remixed by X and Z. You know, and I want to see how we're going to work citations when we have three or four people remixing it. This is something we perhaps need to think about. But it's interesting. It's embedded in the concept. So always try and think of the four R's of OER. Okay. And now, let's talk a little bit about licenses. Uh, this is the essence, yes? as we know. So, even within open educational resources, we have a degree of openness. We can think of a degree of openness to a little open, let's say, open, but perhaps not as much as it could be very open. And what's the difference? So, in the first one here, on your left, is considered to be the most open license of all of them. So the first thing we have to say when you're talking about open, um, licenses, I think Laura has already mentioned it this morning, is that you're not giving away your rights. You're not. What you're doing is you are saying to your user, when you apply one of those licenses, what they can or cannot do with your content, with your resource, whatever it is, audio, a podcast, a video, a text, a book chapter, a piece of research, a paper, whatever it is. So, it doesn't matter which license you choose, you can see there is always the, the, uh, the figure of a person, which means you're the author, you're always going to be cited, always. It doesn't matter which license you choose, okay? So you're moving from that perspective of all rights reserved for, from copyright to some rights reserved. You reserve yourself some rights, to say, that is, to say what the user can or cannot do with your content. So the first one is the most open of all, of all the licenses. Then you have this one here in which you say it's for non-commercial purposes, so you actually allow people to modify, yeah? you just don't allow commercial use of it. This one you are always cited by non-commercial and no derivatives. So here, in terms of OER, it actually breaches a little bit the principle of re remixing, doesn't it? Um, you know, but in some cases it's necessary. 
because if you are dealing with sensitive research data in the health sciences or whatever, you know, and you, you don't really want this data to be changed by any reason, I mean, you may have a reason for choosing this license, there is this possibility when you don't want any sort of remix to your content. Now, the, this one is the share-alike. Non-commercial use share-alike license, which means that when someone uses your content, they have to share it with the same license that you chose initially. And this is a very interesting one. This is a very open license in the sense that you guarantee that your original resource will be kept, will be shared continuously in an open way, if you think. It guarantees some sort of continuity to the process of openness if you choose a share-alike license. So this is something to, to bear in mind because if you choose this one, you're very open, you're saying to people, you can make commercial use of my content, you can remix it, but they can choose a different license if they want to. And say, for example, non-derivatives, whatever, right? Okay, and here, non-derivatives, CC by share alike. So I think, I think this is very, oops, sorry. I think this is pretty straightforward, uh, but you just have to think what you want to do with your content and what you want people to do with your content. Um, and there is another benefit of using um, Creative Commons licenses. If you go to the website and you get the HTML code and you embed it into your website or into the place you are uh, making your content available, it helps search engines to find your work. So that's another benefit. So it's not only a matter of putting the logo in there, but embedding, by embedding the, the HTML code, you help search engines to make your work searchable and findable, right? So this is something to think about. Another reason for licensing your research papers, for example, if you're talking about visibility online, etc. Okay, now, something else that is important to think about. You're talking about openness. Openness is a matter of attitude, above all. Acculturation, being able to share, a mind shift, a shift on the way we think, a shift on our practices, yeah? But it, it has a range of, of different aspects to it that it would be interesting for us to think about. Um, so it's this um, intention to share, but also to think in terms of the technology, because you're going to say, okay, I'm going to share my paper, but it's going to be in PDF, so I'm going to make it really hard for people to remix it, right? They can read it, oh, I'm sharing, but it's in PDF. Okay, all right. I'm going to share my slides, but it has to be only in slide share. Why is that? Are you sharing or are you not sharing, or are you just sharing a little bit? So, it's obviously absolutely okay, but why can we not try and move towards more open formats just to make remixing easier? Because it's very frustrating when you're trying to remix something that is it's difficult because it's with a close, like on a proprietary uh, platform or in PDF or somewhere you cannot really have access to. It's frustrating and you have to go around to find ways for remixing. So it's about opening up for licenses, but also opening up for technology use. And this is very easy. So if you think that most of the documents we produce are dot .doc or dot .docx, yeah, for, for the ones who use Apple um, equipment, these are proprietary formats, yeah, and we have to buy them. In some countries, if you're actually talking about intercultural exchange, you know, not many people have access to Microsoft products that easily in some schools you visit, they do not have access very easily to Microsoft products. And we do have options nowadays, which is the open office uh, package that you can download for free. Um, so the only reason why my PowerPoint, my PowerPoint slide is not in open office is because I've got a new netbook and I haven't had the time to download it yet. I <laughs> couldn't download it in the plane, um, but um, this is something strongly advisable, right? So if you can use openoffice.org, you don't need to buy the package and you have all the main components uh, compatible. Yeah, so Microsoft, Microsoft, you have Word, 
you have um, um, Excel, uh, you have PowerPoint, etc. Okay, that you can make it easier for people uh, to open and remix and convert into other formats if they want to. Right, any comments until here? Questions, comments? No? Can I move on? Okay, yeah. Please. All right, Laura. Oh, you're just stretching your neck. Okay. Can you please? Yeah. Yes, uh, that's the idea actually. The more formats you make available, you know, the more access you're giving to your content because you're reaching a wider audience, really. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Now, I'm just going to have a very, very brief and quick look into business models here because you, we would need an awful lot of time to talk in details about each one of them. I'm going to talk very briefly about them and then my, my goal is to actually show you some open educational resources initiatives and so we can try and identify these business models in them, right? So that we can try and develop an eye for, for um, uh, analyzing OER initiatives whenever we are using resources or trying to think of our own uh, initiative. Okay, so the first model, perhaps the most common model, because that's how OER initiatives started. I don't know how many of you actually know how OERs have started, but um, the Hewlett Foundation plays a big role in it. It's an American foundation, and they have funded most of the existing OER initiatives in the world. Hundreds of OER initiatives in the world have been funded by the Hewlett Foundation, right? So MIT, when they first started doing it, uh, teachers were putting up on the web just notes, lecture notes. Ah, and they noticed, oh, this, okay, this is bringing an awful lot of attention to, you know, we, we didn't expect there would be so many people interested in lecture notes, blah, blah, blah. And so then Hewlett Foundation decided to invest more in MIT so that they could have more resources, better resources. And just after, in 2005, they've decided to invest at the Open University UK $10 million for a two-year project to understand how open educational resources could make a difference. So the Hewlett Foundation invested in a research project. They didn't invest in an OER initiative, right? OpenLearn was one of the first big research initiatives in the UK, in the world, and it was set up as an re re action research project. And this is something many people don't know. And that's why we have a research report, right? And it was done with the foundation money, donation really. So we received $10 million to use it in two years to understand how people could benefit from open educational resources. So we wanted to know who the users are and how we could offer open educational resources, understand the process, okay? So, donation. So you can find a funding body or a foundation, you know, providing funding for the production. And it initially kicks off the initiative. That's how mo most initiatives up to now have been kicked off. They may have uh, uh, perhaps made the process more automated into, day, into their day-to-day -day routines after the initial funding period have run out. But most of the initiatives have started with some sort of external funding or internal funding, as I'm going to show you. Subscription model. Uh, it's a model that is perhaps not the most common model when, where institutions pay to become members of a consortium, which manages the repository connections is an example. You're going to see that. There is the contribution model. This is interesting because it's interesting because sometimes we don't think of our practice, our time used to produce resources, to look for a platform to publish as something that has to be paid by someone. The thing is, OER has a cost to be produced and to be used. And someone has to pay for it some, somehow in this process, somewhere in this process. And we have to bear that in mind. 
right? Whether it's whether the cost is embedded in this institution, whether it is with research funding, with external funding, or the cost of your own time, even if you're doing it at home, you could be doing something else with your time, it has a cost. And this is something to bear in mind. Okay, so sometimes people say, okay, this is just a contribution. I do it in my own time at home because I, but because I want to promote my work, I want to build my reputation, so people have motives, they have reasons for doing that. Students, we talk about user-generated content, right? Students can be OER producers as well. Um, so you have the contribution model. Sponsorship, this is interesting. Uh, it's when, for example, I'm going to give you an example. There is a university in, in, in Brazil, uh, which is a business, very famous business university, and they have companies um, sponsoring their courses. So they say they are running a course, on, an open courseware, a course on insurance, and they have an insurance company sponsoring the production of that course. And the only thing they have is the logo of that company there. Okay, because the company wants visibility, Right? So they sponsor the course and the university makes it available. So you have a number of different models for sponsorship. So this is, this is one of them. Institutional is what I said. When the university itself decides to embed the costs of OER production and provision into their, uh, their own activities. And we have to bear in mind that we have to think of context, you know, it's very naive to say that, oh, me as an academic, I don't, I don't really care about that, I don't really care, I just want to make open content. You've got to think that there are, if you're, if you're coming from this sharing perspective, there are institutions that are privately run, you know, at least in Brazil, I don't know if you know that, but 85% of higher education in Brazil is run by private institutions. So if you don't present these institutions with an interesting business model, they are not going to get into open educational resources. And they should for the social reason, for a social purpose. They are responsible for teaching, not as much for research. Research is, more, is done mostly by public government funded institutions. But they need a reason to share their teaching, particularly their distance learning teaching, which they are very good at producing distance learning content. But we have to tell them, okay, you've got to have an investment, this is how much you're going to invest, but at least you can expect reputation, you can expect some sort of registration. If you don't have anything to bargain with, it's very difficult just to, um, to make them agree just by saying this is a very altruistic thing to do. We all like that, we agree with that, we think this is something good to do, but you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, try and convince someone to do that just by saying it's altruistic. It's difficult. Okay, um, governmental funding. These are cases in which resources are created exclusively with government funds, so uh, you must have examples here in Africa that you can tell me about. Uh, in Brazil we have examples as well. The Minister of Education alongside the Minister of Culture make repositories available, 100% financed by the state. Okay, but these repositories actually target the National Development Plan for Education, so they have specific aims, political goals, educational goals, right? They're driven um, for political agendas, for development, etc. And obviously, you have a commercial model, and also you have a blended model, which is interesting. Sometimes it's an institutional model merged with a commercial model. A commercial model is when you have for example, uh, the courses are offered, you have some sort of the content available online and then you make the user pay for a little part of it, a symbolic fee, a minor amount for parts of this content, for example. Or they pay for tuition or they pay for certification, for example. Right? These are all models that can help you make um, your OER initiative a bit more um, sustainable. So, this is just something very quick to think about. I want to go on and show you a, a Mexican initiative now called TEMOA from the um, in, uh, Tecnológico de Monterrey, that's the name of their university, to show you some features, okay, and to see if we can identify how they've been doing it. 
Well, the MOA is, it has an institutional model. It counts on institutional money, okay? So they've decided to do it, to be part of their teaching and learning strategy. So every time, the, it's interesting to see when you read university reports or when you interview people and you ask them, why is it that you're doing open educational resources? A lot of times they, they start by talking about their university's mission. So usually the initiative is aligned with the university's mission, the vision for teaching and learning, what, what they see the institution should be doing. Uh, and quite often it has to do with a new type of teaching and learning strategy, something new they want to implement, a new type of research trend or technological development or, or just new pedagogical practices they want to develop, particularly when they offer distance education. And it's much more difficult to see open educational resources initiatives in campus-based only institutions. Yeah? Okay, so Temoa, as I said, Temoa is interesting because um, they have a model uh, in which the institution supports the initiative, but the content offered there does not belong only to the Tecnológico de Monterrey. They actually are very good at designing systems, technological systems, so they've developed their own system, their own platform, uh, and they uh, scan, users can suggest content, and they gather the content together within Temoa. So you can find content from all over the web in there. So it's an institutional repository in terms of the business model finance, but it does not contain only institutional content. So that's an interesting model to think of. Okay? So their own academics can suggest they have a team that actually look at the content and, just, and, and they have a set of rules. If you go to the frequently, frequently asked questions later on, if you have some time and read through, you see the set of rules that they look at to decide whether content is okay to go online or not. Their type of license, you know, whether they are, you know, whether it's, it's not any type of, uh, of content that is not in line with, with their mission, their vision. Anyway, they assess the content and then they accept it into the repository or not. So they have a team in place for that. An expensive model, if you think, right? Because you need a dedicated team for that. Okay, what else have we got? So I have a list of, on the left, I have a list of subject areas. You can yourself suggest content, you can share content, you can also, when you, when you find content there, you can use the platform to, to remix, so to take something from web, one website, something else from somewhere else, and create a third thing. This is something very interesting. Okay, so the types of participation there, you can be a collaborator, as you can see in the first one, Someone who can suggest op new open educational resources to Temoa. You can be an auditor, so the roles one can play in terms of user engagement with your platform. One can be an auditor. Uh, it's someone who can make a peer evaluation of the educational resource. And this is, this, is a, this is an interesting concept for open educational resources, for quality assurance, is to count on peer review. Yeah? Community peer reviewing is, is an interesting concept there. So you can be the auditor or you can be a ca cataloger. I don't know how to, how to pronounce that. <laughs> and that is uh, someone who is an expert, librarian, in particular librarians should be interested in that. Uh, someone who understands of standards and they use this American Library of Congress classification. They're very uh, worried about bibliometrics and this sort of things. So if you think you can contribute somehow because you have this librarian knowledge, you can, you can be a cataloger. Well, okay, there you go. Okay, um, I thought I would show you one of the units. You have, you have also, besides having these roles as a user, you can also have a rating system just like Amazon has with the difference that in Temoa, it's one of the repositories that I find very interesting, you can leave a comment about the resource. So you not only rate it from one to five, but you also have the chance to say what you think about it. And it's so useful, isn't it? 
how many of you have actually used TripAdvisor to look for a hotel or something? You know, it's, it's so good to be able to read what other people have to say about it. So this is interesting about Temoa. So this is all techniques for uh, peer reviewing, community peer reviewing quality assurance of content. Um, so this is one of the, the resources there that, that is considered the best rated one. And it has only six reviews and it's been there since 2009. And this is something I wanted to, to point out because we think that reuse is going to be something immediate, don't we? We say, yeah, you're going to publish and this is going to be reused immediately. Sometimes you've got a resource there, lying there on the web for quite a while until people can find it out, can discover. So we, we have done studies on, on the life cycle of one open educational resource. For example, OpenLearn is a two-year funded initiative when it was just started, starting picking now. The platform itself, we had to finish, you know, we had, we had to look for more funding. And they said, oh, we are just now starting gathering users. Now we are having data. It's done, two years. No, you need to give it time. You need patience for acculturation, first of all, of people, of users. You know, it's going to take a while for us to get into this process of revising, remixing, reusing, rating content as much as we do it with hotels and other things. You know, it takes time, of course. Yeah, so be patient. Yeah, so I was just thinking of what Frank said yesterday about um, let's rate academics to as many downloads they have from their content. You know, as much as citations, you know, you rate academics for their citations, let's rate for their download of their content. You've got to give it time. <laughs> anyway, it's just a joke. Uh, so you can go straight to the resource in there. And the interesting thing is that you can look at uh, the, the profile of the person who has uploaded the content. This person happens to be a staff member of the Tecnológico de Monterrey. But as you can see, she's received many reviews for other contents. contents. She has uploaded 363. Um, and you can see, you can see. So this helps you to find, to, to think of the re reliability of what you're looking at and using and teaching your students. Um, to think of reliability. If you're curating content, as Laura was saying earlier, it's important to look at the profile of whoever has published and their reputation, online reputation. OK, so this is an example. OK, so once you access a content, it takes you outside the platform to a third party uh, um, initiative or website or whatever and this is what happens with this piece of content in mathematics interactive mathematics it's a it's a website licensed under Creative Commons non-commercial share alike and that's why it could go into Temoa yeah it takes you there okay so this is just an example of the reviews people can do to the content and this is, okay, this is for Temoa. Any questions so far before we move on? Any comments, any reflections? Anything you'd like to say? No? Okay, I'm not looking at my Twitter here. I don't know if there is anything on Twitter that I should be looking at or the blog, but I'm gonna go there in a minute. Okay, so now let's go from, from Mexico back to the UK, okay? Leeds Metropolitan. I find Leeds Metropolitan a very interesting example of an institutional repository. It had initial funding from JISC, which is a UK funding body, uh, but it has taken a different approach. You see, similarities, let's think a little bit of, of Temoa. Temoa has an institutionally developed platform, right? They don't use an open source or external commercial platform. They have developed their own platform because they have the skills for that. Leeds Metropolitan has gone for a commercial platform with a very good search engine. I mean, they've chosen what they thought would suit their needs. So they've gone for a commercial platform. And if you go online, you can find their reports and they explain exactly why they have made that choice, if you're interested to know, okay? They have also decided, unlike Temoa, that they would have only content produced in their university available online. So they don't have external content. So when you are there, it, doesn't take you, it does not take you elsewhere to a third party website. 
and then you will only find Leeds Metropolitan content. Okay? So you can think of different models there. They've also decided to separate research content, academic papers, from open educational resources, courses, PDFs. Uh, and actually, you see that the formats vary. They have PDFs, video lectures, podcasts, all sorts of formats available. They have made that choice. And this is very much a contextual institutional choice. It depends on your platform, it depends on your goals, on your strategy, why you're doing what you're doing. So if you're doing OER, you've got to have a strategy. Why is it? Yeah, in their case, their main goal uh, was to make their, co because they have a, a kind of consortium of universities, affiliated universities, wh in which they validate the degree. And they wanted to make it easier for them to share content with this, I think it's 19 associated universities. So that's why it was something very institutionalized in, in the way it's only their content being shared. But obviously by doing that, they also acknowledge that they are making content available to the world, right? Which is true. It's interesting. So, just looking inside Leeds Met initiative, so you have there everything licensed. Uh, you, you can download the file, so you can take it out of the platform, but you cannot put anything back into it. Okay? Whereas in Temoa, you can suggest, and if people like, like your idea, like your resource, they'll accept it into the platform. So I'm just thinking of redistribution, right? Okay, comments? No? Shall I have a look at Twitter? Any? Pardon? How do they upload? Oh, they have a special team for that. It's, it's all, um, their academics decide what sorts of contents, all the departments, they have someone responsible for deciding what goes, what is okay to go online or not. And they have a special team that uploads the content in it. So again, it's costly, you need to have, it doesn't need to be many people, but you need to have dedicated people for that sort of work, yeah? It's not do-it-yourself like the British like, in this case, DIY. Yes, uh, the, the yes can you put your mic on? Who's, who's that? Okay. Yeah, I, I was wondering, uh, there are cases where maybe someone can write materials or present conference papers, and then others start seeing them as open educational resources and then how can that be looked How can that be? Okay, what is the requirement for it to be, if it is what, a paper, a paper published or a conference presentation? Like a PowerPoint slide. Okay, so it's first of all how you make it available. How you make it available to the public. So if you are publishing your research paper in an open access journal like the one, uh, the ones Laura showed us earlier today. I don't, I don't know if you, if you're here or not. But if you're publishing a paper in an open access journal which has an open license, the sort of Creative Commons one, you can consider your research paper an open educational resource because an open educational resource, we have to remember, besides having different formats, audio, video. Um, texts, you know, they can also be uh, research or courses from learning objects of any size, right, to modules of courses to entire courses. And the courses, when you're talking about courses in terms of OER, we're talking about open courseware. So when you say open courseware, we're talking about courses. All the rest, open educational resources, whatever it is that you want to say. Okay, so if it has a license, it's an open educational resource in the type of research production, okay? If it's um, a PowerPoint slide presentation like the one I'm using, you have to put a license on it to say that it's an open resource and hopefully make it available somewhere so people can find it, right? <laughs> so I think, I, does that answer you, your question, yeah? Right, okay, um, let's move on. 
Okay, I, I better rush because I want you to do some work together. Okay, cnx.org, an American one, now you're going to the US, you're traveling around the world of OER here, having a look at some initiatives. cnx.org, again, initially funded by the Hewlett Foundation, okay? I think that for the first four batches of funding, they had something like $4.4 .4 million and then perhaps much more than that. But you see, the Hewlett Foundation has invested a lot. Uh, in OER. Interesting, what is interesting about connections is that it enables users to uh, put content back so you can go there. Actually what I'm showing there is one of my, it's a book chapter that I've written and I've, I've decided to try connections myself and I've put it up there, you know, and that someone has to accept it. I don't know if they have some sort of assessment, evaluation of what you give, of what you um, upload, but you know, in less than 24 hours my book chapter was there and I can see that people have been reading and downloading it from Connections. Okay? So if you, if you have produced yourself content and you don't know as a teacher, as a lecturer, as a researcher, you don't know where to put it. You know, there are uh, OER platforms which enable you to do that. Connections is one of them. Okay? It's, and it's always good, as Laura said, to publish in different formats open formats like .odt and in, in a number of different platforms the same content because it increases the possibility for people to find it, to find your content. Okay, now going, going to South America now, Brazil, back in Rio de Janeiro, TECA. TECA is an initiative funded, again, all of them, you see I'm always talking about funding of some sort of funding. There is nothing that can be done in terms of OER without any money. So, you've got to bear that in mind. TECA is an initiative um, funded by a foundation. It's a consortium of six public, pub, public universities, I mean universities that students don't have to pay for studying. They are fully funded by the government, okay? And by private, because I know it varies from country to country, this definition. By private universities, I mean universities that students have to pay for a fee. In Brazil, students can study without paying anything at all if they study in a public university. Okay? If they study in a private university, they have to pay their fee with no help from the government. Sometimes they can get some help from the government, but they're expected to pay for the fees themselves. So this one, this one is a consortium of six public universities that initially they had decided to make this consortium just to share content between themselves because they were getting into distance learning and they wanted to be able to share content for distance learning purposes. And then they realized they could make their content available. So it's a very incipient initiative in a number of ways. In terms of technology, in terms of formats, it's in early days. You know, there's an awful lot to be developed. But it's something interesting because of this consortium model. And talking about public, uh, uh, um, universities collaborating, it's a big step forward. It's something very, very difficult to be seen, you know, because it's very bureaucratic, you know, and so getting people, academics to work together and share content and decide that, okay, I'm going to teach my course using your content and you can teach your course in your university using my content is a big step forward. So in that sense, that's a very interesting model to think of what OER can do for you if you license your content, you can share between institutions. So that's interesting, that's what Teca does. So this is just an example of, you can search for Paulo Freire, most of you have heard of him, uh, and you can find the content in PDF format to download it, take away with you. Okay, moving on. Now, everybody knows Open Learn. I'm gonna go a little faster now. But just thinking, um, this is a unit I've actually written for Open Learn a few years ago. Uh, teaching, trying to teach people how to repurpose within the website, within the initiative, the initiative's website. But what's interesting about OpenLearn is that initially it had two websites, one with only institutional content and another one which, rep which is called the lab space, which reproduced institutional content, content. What I mean by institutional content? Content produced by the institution only, quality assured, okay? But that people could remix and could uh, put back whatever they wanted remixed, 
Okay, and that website, the university didn't take responsibility for quality. They only would take responsibility for quality in the first one. That was the initial model. But as the funding finished and they had to evolve and embed into their day-to-day uh, -day activities uh, the production of OER, they have decided to, to have uh, a different format altogether. And they are kind of now separate websites with different funding sources. Okay, so the learning space now remains funded, fully funded by the university itself, okay? And the, the lab space, which the name says, it's a space for a laboratory, a space where people can play and do things with the website, a more web 2.0 based website, is still waiting for further funding. So it's a bit unsure, uh, it's a bit not, not certain at the moment what's gonna happen to it. But anyway, what's interesting is, is that in both websites, you have not only content, but you have tools that help learners learn. So you have discussion forums, it's all based on Moodle, open platform, so again, technology. Instead of going for a commercial one or using a platform developed by the Open University, they decided to go for an open source platform. Okay, so th this is Moodle based. Um, so you have FM, live communication. I'm showing the, the left hand side of your screen is a web video conference tool so you can book a video conference for free and that was supposed to and that that's the idea of having it there that people will study in the same unit so i'm studying history a course in history and there's someone in japan is studying a course in history and they say okay i want to chat with someone i don't want to be a loner informal learner you know i am able to book a web video conference with my japanese colleague if i want to talk about this content to get some peer learning going, you know, so that was the idea. And I think this is incredibly innovative, although it was set up back in 2006, isn't it? It's technology favoring informal learning. So this is something for us to think about. Um, knowledge maps, so they have, they have so those technologies there on the left are, uh, have been developed by the Open University. Knowledge maps, you can download this tool for help you learn and map your knowledge, you know, creating knowledge maps on your desktop for free. Uh, you can have your learning journal, you can have informal learning clubs with learners from all over the world if you want to. We've managed to find a few examples of it happening in the website. That was one of my tasks to look for the sort of evidence going on. It's interesting. And forums, okay. Now, interesting, the formats that you can download content in there. You can print the unit straight out you can have an RSS feed, you can download the unit straight away to your computer. But you also have the interoperability thinking behind it. And this is something that we sometimes forget. Can my initiative, my platform, communicate with other platforms? Can we exchange content within institutions more easily if we have an interoperable type of technology using I don't know, um, as they have SCORM compliant formats, uh, IMS common cartridge, you take from one Moodle straight into another Moodle platform straight away without having to worry too much about it. That's interesting. These are things to think about. And, and OpenLearn allows it to happen. And on Friday, I'm hoping to show you how it happens in practice because I'm going to give you an example of an intercultural exchange of content because of interoperability, what it enables you to do, okay? Now, and again, what else? Other formats, more up-to-date formats. E EPUB, e-books, you can have an e-book format, or a Word document, which again, although it's Word, it's Microsoft, it's easier to remix something in Word than something in PDF. It's always something to bear in mind, and they are doing that. So it's good to see that happening. Okay, now the lab space. So re just to remind you, this is, this is the institutional content only. This is the, uh, the same open learn with the same content, but where users can interact. They can put up their own content up there, okay? Um, so again, you can download the units users produce, you can have a Moodle backup, and that's it for open, for open learn. Any questions so far? <laughs>
Okay, I think I've got too many uh, initiatives to show. And I'm going back to Ecuador, very I'm finishing now, hopefully. I'm going back to Ecuador. Ecuador has an open courseware model, okay, in which they offer courses. But it's interesting because I think it's a bit of a conflicting identity there between you and me. I couldn't really, between you and me and the world, <laughs> and my colleagues in Ecuador. I've got colleagues there, we work together anyway, and we, we're going to talk about it further. I, uh, this is something to think about because they have two websites and sometimes for the user it's, it's difficult to know what you can do in one website or in another one. So in terms of institutional strategy, this is something to think about because they have this open courseware one and this, this open UTPL one. So I know one is Moodle based so I understand it's a bit more interactive and I think you can get certification whereas in this one you just download the content. Okay, But if you're thinking of it institutionally you may decide that you want to have a unified identity for your OER initiative or you should be able to explain exactly to your user where to go. Okay, now, I, I'm going to, before taking you to the, to, the, um, to the template, I'd like you to have five minutes talking to the person sitting next to you about this initiative that I've shown you. If you can identify business models and if you can see your institution doing anything like that at all, whether it is by setting up a new platform or by using a third part, party platform, whatever, just, just brainstorm and five minutes only. Okay, please, thank you. And I want to ask you about something you mentioned in passing, but mm -hmm. not now, later. Mm -hmm. Which is, you said the government had a repository that was linked to the National Development Plan. Yeah, and I yes. I would like to see that. Okay, I'll show you in my UNESCO report, but I'll show you to that's mine. Right, that's very interesting for some other work that I'm involved in. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll show, you. I'll show that to you. Because that's quite um, innovative for government. Yeah. Yes, there is a story behind it, so I'm going to tell I you. Okay. Okay. I don't know if we've, if we've had five minutes, but I would really, really like to hear from you something about what I've been showing you so far, or maybe if you can tell me anything about. South African experiences or your own personal experience in using or providing OER, I would really like to hear from you. Before we go to the, to the template itself, shall we take a few minutes to try and see if we can share some personal experiences? Does anyone want to share any comment? Yes, please. Sí. 
my exam, the mock exam, the a tutorial, but there's all these lecture notes, there's everything. <coughs> so again, why are we waiting for students to sort of get onto the bandwagon? Show them. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think that the practice of OER is much better than the idea. Of Absolutely, OER. yeah. <laughs> Indeed, thank you very much. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. You and then. Yes, that's interesting. There's yeah, marketing is, is interesting. It's something to think about. I, I, normally, the marketing departments get very much involved with OER initiatives because they have they see different ways of promoting it, and promoting the institution and promoting the courses. Yeah, please. Exactly. Yeah, this is this is beneficial to the university, and um, but again, something you were talking about yesterday in a private meeting we had. Even though the courses are just a, a piece of the course, it's not the entire course that is offered at the Open University. It, it still has to be self-contained, right? So this this is an important factor. And although we know OERs can be just a, a learning object, but in the case of the OU, it's like if it's a unit belonging to a bigger course, it's a self-contained unit that makes sense on its own. Yeah. Okay, now, um, if you can download this template from, from, from the blog, if you want to, and take it home and remix it, reuse it, and just take it home to think, to, to use it as a thinking tool. I, I, I put it together just more as a thinking tool, and it needs an awful lot of work on it too to be able to really help us. But I, I'm, I'm hoping that this template is going to be... Uh, no, sorry, let me just put it up here. A tool for us to work now, a little bit together. And you can think of it in different ways. You can think, it depends on your own context. If you're planning to uh, create OER or use OER as an individual, you know, you still can think of a strategy. Whether it's for or your own career, uh, your own research work, how you want to uh, implement OER into your research interests, and you, what can you research that is open access, whatever, just think of a strategy. How can your students benefit from it, etc. Or if you want to think of OER implementation because you run a research group, you want to apply for a bid, you want to get some research funding, you know, it's something small within a research group, a department. It's always possible to think small, yeah? Individual practice, small group practice at a faculty level, or if you are more involved with university management, you know, and if you can think bigger, or if, if you can think institutionally, think big. How can we implement OER in the institution I work for, in the institution I am at? So you can think of this, of this, um, of this template in different ways. So just try and apply it to your own context. So going very briefly, as I said in the beginning, we always need to think of the university's mission, trying and align it so we can justify why we're doing what we're doing and we understand it better contextually. The vision for what we're doing, for anything we do in life, we need a vision, don't we? Short term, long term, when we have a vision, we know what we're heading to much better. Level, institutional, what I mean by 
institutional, local or global. If you're offering, obviously we can only offer what we have to start with, right? So you have courses in English or in Africans, that's what you've got, got to offer. Now in Brazil we have courses in Portuguese, that's what we have got to offer. So it's an institution, so if, if you decide that it's an institutional initiative, you can say, okay, so it's the whole institutional, the whole institution offering just institutional content. Then you can, you can obviously uh, write more about it, you know. Or you can say it's local, it's just my research group, you know, or it's just my students, one classroom that I want to try it out with. Or it's global, no, I really want to share in different languages, I want to share with the world, I want to get content from other people, what is my reach? What level? we want it to be it. Who is my audience? Remember that we talked about audiences in the beginning. Who are my main stakeholders? Very important to know who can support you. You know, I've read hundreds of, hundreds really, because I had to revise lots of reports from the Hewlett Foundation, reports from uh, OER initiatives, and we know that if you don't have people backing you up, main stakeholders in the institution, it's very unlikely that you're uh, initiative is going to take off. So, find people to be in your side, really. Colleagues, champions, you know, you can start small, but if you can go at a higher institutional level, even better, okay? Because it is both, ideally, a bottom-up and a top-down approach for successful OER implementation. This is something you've already seen in research, okay? OER champions, these are the people who actually make it happen, really. You have the backup at managerial level, but then you have the ones who make it happen. People who are really motivated, lecturers, researchers, students who want to share, who want to see it happening. Identify them, use them, be one of them, because you can make a difference. You've seen people making an awful lot of difference and progressing career rise because they were champions in that sense. Leaders. Possible connections with other uh, collaborations, with other institutions, other departments, you know, always possible, always interesting to have. The more you collaborate, the more chances you have to survive uh, um, and be successful. What is the strategy, mid and long term? Think big, yeah? Funding, now who's funding? Someone is funding, even if it's yourself, because you are an enthusiastic, you are using your own time, personal funding, okay, but think of it. Beads, NGO, funding bodies, how can you get money to support your initiative if it's a small departmental thing? Can you ask money for the university? Can you apply for a grant somewhere? What type of content are you planning to offer? Courses, open courseware, your own research, just learning objects, Open textbooks, another type of OER for basic education mostly. Um, in the case of distance learning institutions, we have lots of uh, printed, printed materials that we can think of opening up. Other type of academic production, user-generated production, learners' productions, other. Awareness raising strategy within the institution, that's a must for every single um, OER initiative that has succeeded, they needed to implement a program of OER awareness raising with training programs, sometimes even running a, a diagnosis, kind of needs analysis first, a survey or whatever, uh, but running workshops uh, or training, some sort of awareness raising strategy. Type of license, you've got to make that decision, be coherent, how you're licensing your, your platform. Are you providing any incentives to your academics to produce OER or you're just expecting people to do it because it's fun? It's time consuming, you, you know, if you sit down to reuse someone else's content, we've had respondents to research saying that they prefer to start from scratch. <laughs> Seriously. Because, you know, it can be. I'm not saying that it's always the case, but it can be very time consuming. You know, until you learn how to remix, where to look for things. In the beginning, it's a big learning curve. Where to find content? Are the licenses compatible? Where can I remix it? Where can I share it back? Oh, you've got to do an awful lot of thinking. Yeah? 
Okay, technology. Am I going to use a commercial platform like Leeds Matt did? Am I going to use a university development, developed platform? Am I going to go for open source to, to have more open standards? Think of that. Um, search engine optimization needs. How can people find? <laughs> how can people find your resources? Do you need to know any analytics? Who who uses your resources? What sort of analytics do you need running in the back? Interoperability with other platforms. Do you want that happening? What are the benefits of having that? Are you going to create a web 2.0 based platform in which you allow users to repurpose, remix, self-publish? Yes, no, why, why not? Yeah? Comments? Okay. Business models. Do you want an income generating type of initiative? Is it needed? Sometimes it is needed, essential. Some universities do not have the spare money and I know of cases in Europe of uh, initiatives that are running, that are considering uh, resuming their activities because of the economic crisis. So there is no way out, you've got to think of it. Yeah? Indirect benefit, there is always benefit. Reputation increases, our colleagues cited there, brings registrations, what, you know, how? Just think of it. Print on demand solutions, yeah? Accreditation services provision, selling certification, tuition. How, what's the strategy? Quality assurance, who is going to, assure, to ensure quality? The community, um, am I going to have a whole department looking for that, uh, taking care of that? Every single resource that comes into the platform. Am I going to use third party content? Other. What's the evaluation? Once I implement it, I need an evaluation strategy. I need to be able to understand what's going on so I can improve it. I can, you know, know what I've done right and what I've done wrong and what I can improve. What's my contingency plan? If all that I've planned doesn't work, what else can I do? What are the expected benefits? Final consideration. So, I would really like you to now please work with your, uh, in pairs of your colleagues or in groups as you wish. Try and think through this, this template and think of it within your own context and see if you can answer at least a few of these questions, you know. I'm not expecting us to leave this room today with this whole, you know, plan, implementation program ready, but at least to have a think through of some of these items that we can discuss in, let's say, 15, 20 minutes. Okay, shall we do that? And use uh, the blog and the Twitter as a back channel for discussion, and I'll be chatting with you for these moments. Thank you. Okay, the template can be downloaded from the blog, from my blog, aisantos.wordpress.com, or I'm going to leave it here showing anyway. I'm going to leave it here. So you can, it's in two pages, I'm afraid, but, you know, I can give it five minutes first page, five minutes second page, okay? Yeah. The address, okay. That's the address. It's there. Thank you so much. You can check if you want more. That's okay. Thank you.
There's no internet connection eh, here. Oh, what a pity. <laughs> Can I join you here a yeah. little bit? Would you like a seat? Yeah, no, no, thank you. I'm sitting where I shouldn't be sitting. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a question about, well, I have a couple of questions, right? but you say on your, like the champions, like at the institution, it's difficult here. It's incredibly difficult here. Where? At Tunisia? To find champions? Yeah, and, and like it's nice to have this opportunity because you were in that room yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I think that, well, look, they started you guys of not asking you for your expertise. They asked you to, to respond to the situation here. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm really interested in how people actually got beyond this, this invisible barrier, you know, to implementation. Mm -hmm. Because right now we're still sort of trying to convince people that there's some value here, you know. Mm -hmm. um, no one's really doing much. Okay, I see what you mean. And You've got to show the value where, you know, so they can see, you, they can see examples, yeah. they can see where to... But every time, so the conversation remains at the, let's convince people about this, mm -hmm. instead of let's do this and show results. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think yesterday in the room you saw, mm -hmm. we still need to be convinced, so for right now, there's nothing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there needs some convincing, yeah. Mm. Yeah, but it, it's, I think they're coming from this, 
idea that it's all about provision. You know, we offer, we offer, but we don't take anything back. You know, and it's it's actually not only that. You can actually, if we embed into academic practices, you can somehow. Like the Serdej, the Teca consortium, the one I've showed. This exchange of resources is beneficial because you actually save money in course production, yeah, for example. But, but if, if he then decides to work with the students, and in the process they create OERs, and there is some intellectual input that comes from his side, then he's creating materials as well, and they would like to then put it online under open license, and it would somehow get into problems with the existing uh, policy of the university. So then, can you just go ahead and do it, or does he need to first get a permission from the management to do it? Well, this is, this is it. If the university holds the copyright, because this and is always the case. But the thing is, the author always holds the, the rights, the moral rights. The it's always the, rights the... Yeah, but still, if you ask for university for permission for circulating your content, mm. you shouldn't get a no as an answer. You know, it's very unlikely that they'll say to you, no, you cannot. Okay, so I think that yes, there's something that came out because then that does give sort of a, a response. Because yeah. the, um, Professor Bajna then said that he signed off on those. Yes, can I have your for that username and password? My what? The username and password. My the username and password. The one you showed me when I Okay. I want to use I'll be it back in a second. Me. Okay. Okay, how about five minutes more? So, and then we come back for a group discussion. Please give it back to me, okay? <laughs> yes. So what are the answers that you said you got? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I just got lost. No, I, I, I definitely think we should always keep top management informed mm -hmm. and they, we should have them in our sides. So if you let, even let them think that this is their idea, it's even better. Have them on your side and things will happen. Oh, I, I, I can, I just got back there now. Um, it's what he said yesterday that he signed up on the 30 of those YouTube videos that yeah. have been released. Yeah. But also that um, from now onwards it would be a live management of the process. So it will line when you sign up on these videos and should be considered fine. But it's something that needs to be shared with these people. Yeah, that was some sort of the internal element. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but you see. So you slowly get and go pay before you can do it. Speak of the mic, please. It's just because they're taking it far too seriously. I haven't seen it happening anywhere else. Seriously. Have you seen the discussion deflected in the way it's no, but I think it's just a process. It's, a, it, it's, it's gonna get there eventually. You know, they have to see people doing it and they have to see benefits in doing it and they have to loosen up. Quite often it's people that are not used to Web 2.0, to the mm. internet themselves. So they, can't, they don't know what they're talking about that well, yeah, like quite often. Yeah. But I mean, like, how would you respond to that kind of argument where he says that some of the content is being used commercially? It's where, fine. But I mean, like, where like companies pay for that content uh, and then they sell it to you know whoever. Like, okay. And then if that's the case, if the if so that's the approach Open Learn has taken. They've released five the Open University. They've released five percent of their content, right? If they said, okay, if it's another university that is taking up my course and using it and charging a fee for their students. It's still some commercial purpose, but I don't care. I'm going to let people use it, even if they're charging a fee. But if it's a publishing house that is getting the content as ready as it is and publishing it as a book, that's an infringement, really. You see, it depends on the level and how seriously you want to take it. So 
you've got to be flexible. You've got to allow certain things to happen and know that they will happen. But when people exceed, and if they are making an awful lot of profit out of something packaged, just out, straight from the oven, let's say, then it's something you can complain against and you have the rights to do that. Okay. And, you know. and you, I mean, you have been dealing with policy like in Brazil, right? And I mean, if, if you have a, like an existing institutional policy, like let's say like Unisa, right? And then if they would want to create a supplemental policy, like mm -hmm. open policy, like or like a policy for creation of OERs or, uh -huh. or like open courseware or whatever, I mean that could coexist with the existing policy as well, right? Yeah. Because it would be like a new project, basically. Yes. Yes. So, and I think that this is something that maybe they are not realizing at the management level that it's not necessarily mean, doesn't necessarily mean that. They will have to go all the way deep into their existing policies and modify. No, they can create a new they, one. They can, yeah, they can create a supplemental one. Yeah, absolutely. No, they, have, they actually have. Um, I think Paul posted it a couple of months ago on one of these as well. Um, it would be interesting to speak to him about. Yeah. Why, when you steer from the Open Courseware Consortium, what do you mean? Do you work for them? Yes. Here in, in South Africa? Anywhere. Uh, but I'm based here in Johannesburg, but, but I mean the physical location doesn't matter anymore. Ah, okay, okay, so you're employed by them, so what yes. do you do for them? Well, uh, I'm overseeing the operations management, Okay. and uh, I do a lot of uh, work in uh, research projects. So you work with Mary Lou Forward yes. directly? I've interviewed her in, in Paris and uh, we are going to put her interview in the compendium, Oportunidad compendium in your long oh, okay. chain, pretty sure. soon, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the, the EU project that I was telling you about, that's, that's another one that I'm familiar with. Yeah, yeah. EU Delft. Uh, okay, yes, 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 Delft, yes. Yes. I know those guys, they're nice. But are you from here? No, I'm from Slovakia. Maybe, maybe I've seen you before in one of those open course meetings, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Right. Let's go back to it then. Okay, can we get back now? Um, we have about 15 minutes for a final discussion and I don't know how helpful this roadmap <laughs> was, but uh, the idea was just to prompt more questions than answers at this point, I'd say, really. Um, but I'd like to hear from you if you actually managed to, or if you have attempted to answer any of those parts there and, you know, what sorts of challenges did you find to start with or whether you actually managed to go any further. Does anyone want to share your experiences, concerns, anything? Yes. Yes. So I keep running into that control issue. Um, how do you make sure it's, it's good stuff? Um, yeah. Either to use or to produce. Yeah. Thank you for your comment. It's extremely relevant because this is an ongoing issue, actually. I remember 
Many years ago, running my first focus group uh, in the UK, um, asking people, so what stops you from, from putting up your stuff on the web as an OER? And they say, oh, I've been trying to do it, you know, but I just can't get finished. You know, I still have to revise it and I have to rewrite it. And, you know, it seems a non-ending process. Um, so there are different answers to this. First of all, we have to loosen up. There's no way out. It's just like having a Facebook account and putting up your first update, knowing that everybody else is going to know what you're doing, you know, and thinking, what am I going to write? You know, how much can I tell about what I'm doing? Can I say what I'm eating? Because some people do, or shall I just say where I am at? You know, oh, nice vacation holiday. Well, what sort of, you know, how much can I show? How much can I talk about myself? How much do I want to share? You know, how much do I want to show of my own flaws? And, you know, it's interesting. Um, and um, I remember once writing about OER as a shopping window. On the other hand, it's very true. Whatever you put out there is going to be the image you're going to have your students perceiving of the institution. As I mentioned in the beginning, you know, in the case of OpenLearn, they were using it as a taster to see whether they would like it or not to study online in that particular mode of that type of content. So yes, they were assessing, you know, the university, uh, the course itself, um, whether the course team was up to date in the information, because nowadays students can be very up to date, you know, we don't have students who don't know anything anymore, you know, because of the web. So yes, so you, 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 I think there needs to be a balance, and this, this is what we see. We see people that manage to find a balance. I want to show the best I can within the best that I can do. Uh, you know, if I, if I have to release um, a unit that I don't consider fully ready, but something that I want to release because I believe in peer reviewing, I believe in the community reviewing process, I believe in the movement, I'm going to release it and invite people to comment on it and they will appreciate that I'm being open enough to do so. And indeed, that happens, that appreciation happens. You know. Or I'm going to release that and write in a big watermark draft. Fair enough, it can be an ongoing draft, who cares, you know? <laughs> but there are ways of doing it, but I think that the, the way forward is being open enough to know that it's no perfection, you know, even if you are going open or if you're not going open, it's very difficult to guarantee 100% quality in your content. In the case of OpenLearn, of some of these institutional repositories, they, are, they feel more comfortable releasing content because they feel that the content has already been peer-reviewed, has already been through some quality assurance process. And that's why some institutions prefer to keep the repository institutional only and do not allow people to upload their own content, etc. But do we really want that? Why do we need this much of control? If you are happy for your teacher to, to a lecture, to get into the room and say whatever they want to say, why do we have to control this much when it gets to the web? You just have to make people aware that whatever they say, in, they are representing the institution anyway. They are the institution somehow. Yeah. So I don't know. A, to me, I can only say it's a balance, but that's a difficult one. And always. Thank you. Yes.
until the moment that they decided that the first 80 people volunteering for the project would get a Mac Airbook mm. to work in the project. Who doesn't want that? Suddenly, <laughs> there were about 200 people interested in working in the project. That's a positive stimulus. Uh, at the University of Rome, they, it wasn't as much an OER project as an ODL project. The faculties had to put part of their teachings in, in an ODL environment. Um, and just like it was described, we want to do it, but we want to do it tomorrow. We don't have time at this moment. So the, um, the board decided to cut 10 to 15 percent of the budget of the faculties, and they have to earn it back by uh, activities in the ODL environment. And I think that's a negative uh, stimulus, but still, sometimes you have to make hard, uh, take hard rules, set hard rules to, to do, come a little bit uh, further, because if we're gonna wait for every individual member, and I, I, I find it very sympathetic that you, you always try to find a way of, of persuasion, but sometimes you just have to put down your fist and say, that's the way we're going and yes. that's the way we're going to do it. Yeah, that's very true. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to make a comment about the, the concept about uh, everything has to go through some kind of system of quality control. The question is, where is this coming from? Uh, first of all, it comes from the first concept is that you're going to learn from that stuff and not with it. Because when you want to learn from something, it has to be right. But in this post-modern post world that we live in, what is right and what is wrong? Mm -hmm. So uh, are you being ideological and driving certain people's thinking in certain ways, saying that I have to have the right answer? The second one is the managerialistic approaches. Every, every bit of content must be quality control, but every single lecture is never quality control. So, so we need to start talking about the, the ideological underpinnings of what quality is. Uh, we all know that we suffer in this country by uh, quality assurance processes that are driven by government. And the question is why are they being driven by government? Because it allows government to put its fingers right inside our institutions. And there have been some very interesting cases recently where a university was taken over by the government and that has been deemed illegal against our constitution. So I think we, we need to make sure what, what, what we mean by quality because if we say it doesn't matter about the quality of the thing as but what you do with that piece of information, then it becomes a much more meaningful learning. And we need to talk much more not only about the open learning resources but the pedagogies that are associated with using these, these kinds of tools. But the question, another question I would like to ask is, where is the federated search engine that only searches these OER resources? Yes, I think there are some. Um, I won't be able to point it out right now because I don't remember by heart, but I know that there's something developed, I think, something by KMI, the Knowledge Management Institute at the Open University for the ONET project. Uh, Jorum as well, yes. Um, but there is something um, developed for the ONET project which they, they are trying to aggregate resources and find. And there's something else in the US, but that's something I, I, I'm, I cannot point out right now. But if I, when I find those tools, I'll put up in the blog, okay? But you know, they're still being, uh, how do you say, improved, you know, it's not anything that you can easily find. I think there's something called OER Finder. If you can type it, Google it or something. OER Finder is a tool that comes to my mind right now. But yes, we need, we need more. We need more uh, technology for aggregation and, and search. Definitely. How much time do we have? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, five minutes. Any more, any, any other comments? How, how was it? Did you actually manage to go through this? Did you actually think of anything in particular to your own institutions that could be applicable from what we discussed today? Any models that you think, oh, I think this model could be, some, we could do something like that? Or no, or is it too far away from, from what you had in mind? Yes. 
please. Um, we were thinking about uh, the mission of the university um, being the African University in Service of Humanity. And the uh, area where a lot of the lectures I think find it difficult is the Africanization of the, the study material. So if we can have more cooperation with um, other African institutes, uh, universities, creating some of that material, incorporating it into our modules would be very beneficial. Yeah, thank you. Collaboration. Yes. Interesting. Anyone else? Yes. I just want to. I just want to make the comment that that while we're looking for collaborations, um, let's not look from this point forward because there's so much that has been done on this continent already. So as the the young lady over there was even commenting now, like there's such a lot that's discipline specific as well. Um, and on the continent, we've been so proactive. Um, I think it's time for us now to go out there and research what's being done. It's very true. Sidus work. Sidus, right, you say? Is there someone here from Said? Yeah, there you go. We've all here Africa, isn't it? There's the TESA project, which is amazing as well. An awful lot of resources. So yes, you're right. You're right. It's starting from, from what is already there. Yeah. Well, thank you very much then for your attention. Let's okay. give a hand.